It's a pleasure to be here today with Rabbi Ethan Tucker, who is president and Rosh Yeshiva at Hadar and chair in Jewish law. Ethan also directs Hadar's Center for Jewish Law and Values. He was ordained by the chief rabbin in Israel and earned a doctorate in Talmud and rabbinics from the Jewish Theological Seminary. He's the author of a wide array of halakhic responsa, addressing a diversity of issues, and co-authored the book Gender, Equality, and Prayer, in Jewish law with Rabbi Dr. Michael Rosenberg. Uh, Rabbi Tucker, thanks for taking time today. Thank you, Rabbi Shmuley. Great to be with you. So just to jump right in, how do we think about making halacha more relevant to American Jews in the 21st century who have not engaged with it or have engaged but have not found it morally compelling? I don't know if you have a sense of the percentage of Jews who are in any way persuaded by Jewish law today. Um, but what would it look like? Is it a marketing problem? Is it more of a systemic problem? How do we think about this issue today? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, you know, we have to start from within. I would say, actually, you can't get this process off the ground without yourself as a rabbi or a teacher believing that it's the case, that halakha is relevant, can speak to all times and places, which on some level, actually, for me, is a sort of devotional and religious starting point, even more than an intellectual one. When I think about the Torah being eternal, my commitment to that notion that the Torah is eternal, is divine, has all of these different you know, components to it, is fundamentally actually about uh, you know, saying that the Torah applies in all times and places. And so starting with that commitment is critical. Once you have that, and we can talk about how a person comes to that. But as a, as a leader, a teacher, a preacher, once someone has that, well, then I think you have to do, you know, a number of things. So I'm not sure I can tell you percentages in terms of the American Jewish community, but here's how I would put it. The percentage of Jews who are actively and strategically living their lives day by day, consciously, according to Halakha, is small, right? I don't think we need a... Uh, a social scientist to get us to that precise number. But I think the number of Jews who are doing one of two things is quite large. One, they want to be in resonance with the Torah as opposed to cognitive dissonance with it. That Jews actually, all other things being equal, would like to be in sync with the tradition. That's one thing I think that number is quite high. And the other thing is I think there are a lot of people making all kinds of normative decisions all the time without recognizing actually that halakha engages those same questions and it's just never been translated to them. So I see my own work often as really doing uh, two things simultaneously. And this goes to the part of your question about uh, you know, finding halakha morally compelling or as if it speaks to me. Uh, we gotta do two things. The first thing is, people who have mastery of halakha and expertise in it have to find a way to kind of bring to the surface voices that people may not have encountered that are actually capturing things they already thought. So someone, you know, comes along and uh, approaches an issue, let's say like, you know, gender, which is something that I've done a lot of work on. And they assume, well, the tradition is this way, but the modern world is that way. When we do the work of surfacing the opinions that are more egalitarian than we might have thought, more kind of creative on questions of gender than we might have thought, we not only kind of bring new Torah to life, I think we bring people into the conversation and give them a greater basis of trust. That's sort of part one. Part two is to translate the halakha to people who need to hear it in their own terms, but who are potentially open and should be open to being persuaded by it. That is to say, any deep engagement with halakha and Torah can't just be, I found a way to put my 2019 prejudices into some kind of ancient language. There's some sense in which other times and places coming through the poskim, the great rabbinic voices of the ages, actually speak to us and critique our current moment. For me, this is really a lot about building trust. It's about building trust in the canon and building trust in the people who teach it. And the teachers having some degree of trust that the people in the Jewish community have instincts about a normative religious life that are worth 
engaging with, even if we don't accept them wholesale. Love that. Love that. And I find that, I find that super compelling. Um, so, so let me ask you today, um, to take two extremes, there are those who wish to freeze halakha, and they might not always call that, or to even add new layers of stringency, which is another form of freezing, and those who wish to dis dismiss it uh, in whole. And then there's this camp in the middle um, that seeks to have progressive leanings um, and be in this moment, although it's critiqued from past moments, as you said so well, um, but also have a fidelity to a process. And so I wonder, um, within that space, how do we responsibly think about adapting? There's those who are so frustrated it's not fast enough, and those who are so frustrated that people even talk about adapting. So how do we begin to think about what that's like? Yeah, it's funny. I often find myself uh, sometimes uncomfortably, sometimes, uh, you know, with, with great joy, uh, sitting at the uncomfortable intersection of what is often a very progressive and very creative and very open bottom line of where we might end up on practice alongside what you might even call a kind of Haredi orientation to halakha in terms of our inside it uh, sort of stance and our sense of being just completely committed to piously fulfilling what it is that the Torah and halakha demands of us. In that sense, actually, I, in my own thinking and teaching, really resist the notion of the rhetoric of adaptation or change at all in halakha. I'll give you a metaphor sometimes I've felt helpful on this. To me, the starting point, I said this earlier, is the Torah is the eternal word of God. There is something fundamentally about that that never changes, that no human being should ever have the arrogance to say they can change or adapt. And it's like a light that's been burning since the six days of creation, which is just unchanging and not under my power. That said, that eternal light that burns forever if you imagine putting it on a roadway and you put a green glass in front of it, suddenly everyone's going to floor the gas pedal whenever they encounter it. And you take that same light and you put a red lens in front of it, everyone's going to slam on the brakes. Now, what happened? Is the light any different? It's not. But the lens that goes in front of the light, that filters the light, means that the reception of the light looks and is meant to look very different in different times and places. That has been a metaphor for sort of how I think about the Torah in deep ways. I have no ability to change or adapt the light. What I'm trying to do is figure out what's the lens that I and my generation and everyone at this time and place is receiving that light through, and what part, therefore, of the almost unfathomable pure will of God is being filtered to me in this moment. So in that sense, I feel that I have in the realm of halakha actually a very passive role in terms of shaping or influencing things. But what my role and anyone else's role is, which is critical, is being attentive to the environment in which that's coming to us. So it sounds kind of strange, and I often feel caught, like, is that a very conservative stance? Is that a very progressive stance? Maybe the point is that it's actually eschewing those modes as not getting at the real work. Uh, that's fascinating. So, you, uh, but are you also saying that you don't bring your own sort of philosophical system to what the development of halakha looks like um, as you look forward? Yeah. So, you know, look, obviously someone else always has to psychoanalyze a person of what they're doing, right? As, as the rabbis say, right? A, a prisoner can't let themselves out of their own cage. And there are ways in which the way we think about things, I don't know that we can totally self-diagnose sort of what we think, but to the extent I can be conscious and self-reflective about it, I would say, look, for me, this operates kinds of in stages. Of course, we all bring external frames and experiences. I'm not sure I'd call them external. We bring experiences, stimuli, things that have shaped us and that, yes, often have shaped us before we've then encountered a text that is talking about that same issue. And in that sense, for sure, we bring all kinds of things to our learning. But where I'm trying to get at the end of the day is a fully integrated stance 
where I can no longer actually sort out the difference between my experiences, my inclinations, and the things that the eternal texts from other times and places are kind of shaping me to think about. Rather than sort of focusing on the tension between them and figuring out how I'll resolve them, it's kind of a journey to more deeply integrated uh, mm -hmm. self-understanding and learning. Um, that to me is a process. I don't claim that happens overnight. But I have over time really tried to condition myself to thinking about the process of learning and even of psaq, of halacha conclusion, as one that is about reaching that stage of integration. And I will say on that front that one, uh, one thing I really take issue with is I think you have a lot of thinkers of halacha who think about, well, the best halacha is done in the sort of intellectual and spiritual conditions that are analogous to a sterilized laboratory. You know, I eliminate all outside factors and I'm just running some pure experiment of the rules of science itself. And to the extent there's any corruption from outside forces, it's a kind of infection that will compromise the science. I think that is totally wrong. The best learning that I have done in my life has been when I had an agenda, when I was looking to find something, and I therefore looked under every rock as to what might be hiding under there, as opposed to simply confirming, you know, passive implicit biases I may have had, what you have to be careful about, and I think this is not something that's always present everywhere, are you honestly open to re-examining your preconceptions when you engage a halachic issue? And I try to both allow myself to be self-aware of agendas that I may bring, but to constantly be relentless in saying, okay, but what would someone looking to shoot down this argument say? Who would they cite? And do I have a way of addressing that? And if I don't, maybe I have to reconfigure my argument. Yeah, wonderful, awesome. So um, like many Jews, I find Torah relevant to my personal life, to my, work, my workplace, my home. Uh, certainly my, uh, my community, but um, uh, perhaps more than any other uh, space, uh, I feel Torah to be very compelling in how I think about society, and in particular within the realm of injustice. And I wonder how you think about uh, pre-modern sources, or even uh, modern sources, but from a very different context, and how they may, uh, how those halachic texts may obligate us in types of social justice work today, whether we're dealing with workers' rights or genocide, racism, sexism, immigrant rights, whatever we're talking about, in a way that's neither simplistic nor uh, makes halacha irrelevant to this moment. Um, so first, like, how, how can that be extended? And secondly, what are some of the limits of, of, of those obligations in regards to our societal engagement? And are there other Torah tools um, beyond the halachic realm that, that might be useful? Yeah, it's a great question. And look, you've obviously done a tremendous amount of thinking and work and practical leadership on this front that, you know, has been less my milieu as someone who spends a lot of time in the world of ideas, the world of teaching, and less so in the, in the world of, let's say, on the streets activism. Um, but I'll share, you know, what, what thoughts that I, I've sort of had with respect to this. I will say, I do think any halacha on these larger issues actually has to begin with an agada, um, which I think is not often fully confronted, which is to say there are, there are so many minor questions and local questions that can come up that fundamentally in some way are going to be shaped deeply by do you view the long arc of Jewish history, of God's involvement in the world as something that includes all of humanity, or that is fundamentally parochially, parochially focused on the Jewish people? Do you think that the local Jewish story is still fundamentally in a moment of victimhood and self-protection, or we are actually at the moment where we can return in some way to being more altruistic leaders on behalf of people across the globe? And before one even gets to the halacha, I think if one wants to find one own, one's own place in that, there are some sort of agotic stakes to put in the ground that I don't think everyone agrees on. And sometimes it's just helpful to put them out there and give people a sense of, look, here's my point of departure. If you don't share it, 
you're unlikely to agree with me on this ritva or this tosafot or any other source in terms of where we're going. So that's the first thing I would say. The sort of the agada that, uh, you know, backgrounds the halacha, I think is one thing that's really important. The other thing which I would say is kind of the halachic corollary of that is, I think there are a few kind of big picture interpretive moves that a person engaged in this arena just needs to kind of be clear with themselves on whether they're making them or not, right? The most clear one of those is the question of the status of Gentiles, of non-Jews. When you come across rabbinic texts that distinguish in areas of justice, fairness, damages, et cetera, between Jews and non-Jews, is that a starting point of, okay, I guess I need to take that into account as I build my halacha, or is it being overridden by the position of whether it's someone like the Me'iri in medieval Provence, or the concept of the Ger Toshav as built out by rabbinic law as Gentiles who live among Jews but who are considered to be righteous. Do I buy that as what I've often referred to as a kind of category shift that then gets applied, you know, across the full range of halacha? Because if you want to take all the sections and subsections of Hoshan Mishpat, of civil and criminal law in classic halacha, um, and render them applicable to a wider world, you're only going to do that if you're making one of those category shifts in terms of identity and status. Uh, if you're not doing that, you might have values that could be an interesting model that could inspire people, give people vocabulary, um, but you're not going to really be able to draw a straight line from a medieval and even an early modern world that never imagined that the category of Jew and non-Jew could be flattened in those areas to a world where many of us, not just by ideology, but by upbringing and experience, assume that equality to be in play uh, in those areas. So that, I think, is another thing. There's sort of being honest about the Agadah and then being honest about some broad category things that we are or are not buying. I think the third thing I would add on this is, look, at the end of the day, halacha is a language, if you ask me, on some deep level. It's a normative language. And what that means is it's possible to say a huge range of things. Someone who wants to simply open up a book um, and get the answer that halacha has to say on a, a given topic has not likely spent a lot of time learning halakha in depth, such that you're initially disappointed that there's not an answer, and then exhilarated by the fact that this is such a rich language. So to look to halakha as a way that's going to give us the platform of a you know, given political party uh, or a given uh, activist initiative, that's probably not a realistic goal. But what I think halacha does set up is kind of a language, and I would even say a grammar, around how do we talk about these things? And it does set down certain parameters that are basically in or out of bounds. So, you know, starting with the Torah and the category of the ger, and then rabbinic sources and the category of the ger toshav, like here's one thing I think you can say. You can't be on the playing field of Torah and halacha and claim that because someone's not an Israelite or not a Jew, they're not your problem. You just can't say that, right? That's actually out of bounds. You can argue who falls into the category of your responsibility, who is uh, at what point in history of the Jewish people or generally such that it's reasonable for, the to, for them to take that on. But the Torah and halacha clearly cares broadly about the rights and dignities of human beings beyond the Jewish people. Um, we can talk about the whole language of chiyuv and obligation that the Torah does not just frame uh, the social good in terms of rights and people leaving each other alone, right? There is some basic notion of once someone's in my sphere of responsibility, I have an active responsibility to take care of them. And not every system is built on that. And quite frankly, a lot of both, you know, common law, American law, and the assumptions of contemporary capitalism are often based on, actually, as long as you're not killing someone else, you know, you may be in the good. And that's where I think halakha, in terms of an ethos, 
and a vocabulary and a grammar of morality and responsibility does bring some pretty powerful and distinctive things to the table. Great. So just a final question, just to follow up on that. So looking at that agada, where the fundamental assumptions have shifted, where we may move from a victimhood orientation to one of power and privilege and sovereignty, um, and we want to maintain that language, that ethos, that grammar, and yet the value shift is also so fundamental. What, is that, what does that value shift look like while main, maintaining that language, ethos, and grammar? Maybe there's even an example you would, you would point to of having that continuity while also acknowledging such a fundamental agada shift. Yeah. Well, so again, it does go back to getting to sort of the underlying value. I mean, I'll maybe just play out the example of what the Me'iri does in the Middle Ages in a way that doesn't get a lot of attention, but I think is a model for thinking this through. So the Me'iri is sitting in, uh, you know, medieval Provence with Christian neighbors that we know from his other writings, he doesn't just theoretically respect, but he has real relationships with and theological dialogue. He looks at a whole host of sources in the rabbinic canon and quite clearly uh, is sort of alienated from them on a surface level where he says, what if I destroy my Jewish neighbor's property? I have to pay, but I destroy my Christian neighbor's property. I don't, like, how can that be? And he kind of digs deeper and looks into, well, how did the rabbis talk about this and why did they speak this way? And he finds a sugya, he finds a Talmudic passage that says, yeah, well, God gave the Gentiles the seven Noahide laws of basic civilized behavior. And when they couldn't keep even those, God decided to strip them of all property rights. That is to say, once God saw that the broader world was not careful about not murdering people and theft and basic respect for human dignity, and they didn't have a court system and all of these things that are understood by rabbinic tradition just to be the foundation of being a decent human being in society. But once that was gone, God said, you don't have to pay these people back when you, know, you end up uh, destroying their property because they wouldn't pay you back if they destroyed your property. And says the Me'iri, oh, now I get it. This actually isn't a halakha about ethnicity. This is a halakha that at its internal core is about fairness and mutual responsibility. Once I have someone who matches the moral responsibility, even though they don't match the ethnic group that they were put at in the Talmud, so actually they're more like the Jew discussed in the Talmud than the Gentile, they jump categories, my continuity with the past is then not with the surface application to a kind of ancillary contingent identity, but to the idea which has remained constant and critical, which is you treat people fairly, you treat people who treat you with respect with respect, and you have a basic sense of uh, trying to create with whoever is willing to join you a shared human society of goodness and decency. Very powerful. Well, uh, Rabbi Ethan Tucker, we know many, so many people look to you for uh, inspiration and direction. Can wish you a lot of bracha for continued success. And Chavra, we hope you'll enter this uh, conversation. Come learn at Yeshiva Tadar. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rav Shmuley. A pleasure. Cool too.